So today, today I'm not sure whether I will be able to tell you everything. Have these two topics, probability and structural ability. Depending on how slow or fast we go, for me it would be better to for you to get it, so stop me if you don't understand. So in case we go slower, then I will split this into two parts. If not, yeah, we will go through the whole thing. I'm afraid just the whole thing might be too much. So please stop me if you see, like, I will tell you when is the time and then you can decide. So, so far I showed you the logicist paradigm. I developed it from this idea of having this tree and grounding, having logic in the, in the root and then trying to explain whole mathematics and knowledge from bottom up. And then how this ended up this line with the Gödel's theorem. So show you that architecture kind of follows this, this idea because there was certain interpretation of computation which came from uh, Turing um, and Church. And somehow architects picks up on, picks up on this story over Chomsky and this uh, grammar things. But now I would like to explore a parallel line. And uh, this parallel line starts in 20th century. So just a little bit after the logicist paradigm has kind of see, saw its end. And uh, I wanted to show you that this new paradigm of thinking created a basis of information revolution that happened on the beginning of our century, the 21st century. So let's jump now to, to do now and let's concentrate on one single fact. So I'm teaching this course. I use this technical device and the central processing unit of this device is a piece of silicon, 3.3 centimeters in size, 3, 3 to 3 centimeters in size. And then the internal clock of this piece of silicon runs at a frequency of 2.8 billion times per second, billion times per second. So this is only my computer. I'm not even counting the GPU or the graphic card. And now imagine we have 10 billion of these devices in the world and potentially they can communicate with each other. And roughly they are, have the same characteristics. They could be slower or faster, but their internal clock is defined in the same o level of magnitude as this, yeah? imagine these numbers and only a few generations before us these numbers did not mean anything these numbers were theoretical possibility they did not say anything about the world yeah and they were completely divorced from our human capabilities and then today in the age of social and glo global logistic networks nanotechnology self-driving cars we simply forgot about this we take this for granted it's not even an interesting discussion yeah it's normal for us to have this. And how this, how this is even possible? That's the question. How is this technologically possible? And I would say that this is important to distinguish that today we, we live in a very different world than the world of 19th century. And to unlock this body of thinking that we live in today and that we th think that this is normal, I think we to need to see this algebraist legacy which cultivates abstraction. And for that, we are missing one more line, which I will introduce today. So in his famous uh, 1985 book, uh, quantum physicist Richard Feynman, he wrote a book called Quantum Electrodynamics, The Strange Theory of Light and Matter. And it's a kind of popular book for lay public. And he made his best effort to explain how quantum theory works, but without going into too much math. Yeah? And in the introduction of the book, he writes, he says, the most advanced physics of our time cannot in fact predict any event, yeah? The only thing which it can do is calculate its probability. And it, he's telling this as this was some kind of shocking discovery, but this is not without a reason because Feynman does not assume that the reader understand what this really means. Although we learn probability at school, it's part of every school's curriculum. So let's, t let's talk a little bit about what probability is about. So this line of thinking in emerged in the 17th century and it came from the gambling halls from France and it's about the dealing with things that we do not know for certain. It's about our ignorance, about what we do not know. And it took more than 200 years 
for this line to develop into a kind of coherent branch of mathematics that we call today probability theory. Yeah? And we have a quote of Henri Poincaré from 1902. He's talking in a very general way about the relation of probability and ignorance. So he says, if we were not ignorant, there would be no probability. There could be only certainty. But our ignorance cannot be absolute. For, there, for then, there would be no longer any probability at all. Thus, the problems of probability may be classed according to the greater or less depth of this ignorance. So as you can see, there are no absolutes here in knowing, only kind of a spectrum of possibilities of our ignorance. It's not left and right, true or false. And the foundational event for the probability theory was the publication of, uh, of one book called Ars Conjectandi, or The Art of Conjecturing, by Jacob Bernoulli in, in 1713. And Bernoulli was interested in how can he, how can you estimate accurately these probabilities of events based on the number of how much they occur, number of their occurrences. And his major achievement here was he refined this idea of what is expectation. So he said, it can be seen from what we have said that we are not using the word expectation in its ordinary sense, according to which we are commonly said to expect or to hope for what is best of all, though worse things can happen to us. Here, account is taken of the extent to which our hope of getting the best is tempered and diminished by fear of getting something worse. So by its value, the value of expectation, we always mean something intermediate between the best we hope for and the worst we fear. Again, he speaks about in-betweens here. So this is not very much what we have seen in logic, right? So there we have true and false. This model can only speak about the in-between. Then he conducted the ex experiment. You can see the experiment, but also I'm gonna describe it. So you have a container and it has 5,000 pebbles, so 5,000 little stones. But you cannot look inside the container directly because you're not allowed to see what's inside. So let's say that something covers this, this uh, container. And out of these 5,000 pebbles, there are 3,000 black ones and 2,000 white ones. But since you cannot see what's inside, you do not know what's the ratio. Yeah? And now there's a process attached. So you have a pen and paper, and you make a table with two columns. You put your hand in the container, draw one pebble, and depending on which one you drew, you mark it on the table, so white or black. For example, uh, you mark it on the left if it's white and put it on the right if it's black. And then you put it back into the container and then you repeat, you draw again. Put, put your hand in, draw a pebble, mark it, and then put it back, and then you just repeat that. So what Bernoulli discovered with this simple game is that the more you repeat this process, then the ratio of black to white that you draw on paper starts to converge. So it starts to go to a certain value when you, when you divide one by the other. So this is called a ratio. And it becomes closer to this ratio of three to two. Remember at the beginning we had 3,000 black and 2,000 white. And now we had ratio on our paper which goes something close to three to two. And the more you repeat, the closer it gets to three to two. And this is known as a weak law of large numbers. So the implication of this law, Bernoulli thought this was an amazing thing, he made a kind of philosophical conclusion that if we would kind of extend this principle to the thing, things around us, then the whole world would be kind of governed by these precise ratios and this constant law of change. So everything changes all the time. However, on a grand scale of things, we have very precise ratios, like here. But this observation um, extended kind of to something else. What, what was observed that not only the probability of this independent event start to converge, but also the probability of going away from this average also follows a certain distribution. So you have things which happen and then things around it follow also a certain distribution. So this is something which we know as binomial distribution. As as it, and as you can see here, this distribution follows a certain shape, which looks like a bell, and it's known as bell curve. And the interesting thing is when, whenever scientists observed variation of a large number of, of random trials in nature, so they have a large number of random trials, and you start measuring it, 
you always start seeing this shape. Somehow this binomial distribution always kept appearing as a kind of ideal approximation of things, yeah? Ideal variation away from the mean. And it seems like the average fate of these events was somehow predetermined in advance, yeah? And this, this idea became formalized as, as central limit theorem. So this is what it is about. And now, the guy on the right called Pavel Nekrasov, he was originally a theologist. He published a paper in 1902. So he wrote a paper about the theological debate, whether humans have free will or they do not have free will, or their free will is already predefined somehow. And then he was talking about the law of large numbers in this context. And he liked this idea that we have free will, and he really did not like the implications of this law of large numbers that things will eventually converge. So in order to save free will, he made a claim that this law of large numbers only applies to in the independent events, yeah, which have no links between them. And then independent event, as you know, it's a kind of tossing a coin. And every time you toss a coin, this is really independent what you get from what you got before. yeah. And he said, as soon as events, like in real world, are connected to each other, are dependent on each other, this, this law is not working anymore. But he could not prove it. He just made this claim in a paper. And the guy on the left, the mathematician on the left, he got so angry when he read that, that he wrote, Nekrasov's mathematical work is an abuse of mathematics. His name is Andrei Markov, important name. He said, decided to completely discredit the guy on the right. What he wanted to prove is that this Bernoulli's conclusion about the law of large numbers will apply perfectly to system of dependent events, but under certain conditions. So to prove this, so he needed to prove this, not only to claim it, he created a very ingenious mathematical construction. And his work extended the uh, probability theory in a very new direction. And what is important for us is that his work spawned this inter uh, 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 information revolution at the beginning of 21st century. You will see how. This is the topic of, of the first part of the class. So now let's see what are these independent and dependent events to understand them, how, how this applies to what we have today. So certain kind of events, for example, coin flips. Every coin flip is an independent event because if you now have head, you do not know what you're going to get next. This really does not depend on what you have, what you just tossed. Yeah. And the same is when you roll a dice. But then what is a dependent event? How we can formalize this? How we can also give an example? So let's say we have a game of Monopoly. And again, of course, every roll of dice we make will determine how much we move, yeah? How much our steps, our, our token will advance on the board. But if we want to predict where, where our token will land on the table, then we must at least know where it was in the beginning. So we cannot predict where it will land if we do not know where we started it. Yeah, you get it. If we do not know where it started, how do we know where it's gonna end? It needs to start and then we can predict where it's gonna land. Yeah, this is what dependence events are about. And Markov started talking about that in 1906. So in this case, prediction of an event depends of the previous outcome. So it depends of where it was before. And Markov needed to think, how can we, he make a model that could somehow store this previous outcome to remember what happened before, yeah? And then we can illustrate what he did also in an example, which is quite similar to this Bernoulli's example with cups. Here, I made the cup transparent just to show you how the model works. But later, then we will assume that we do not really know how many pebbles there are in the cup. So first of all, I would like to review with you a little bit of probability theory, the simplest case possible. So if we have five black and three white pebbles in a cup, what would be the probability of, for example, drawing a black one? And what would be the probability of drawing a white one? How would you think about this? Can someone dare to try? Mm. Um, five, five squares or three squares? Yeah. But because there are eight possibilities and five of them are black or three of them are white. Exactly. So, you simply first need to add the number of pebbles. How many are there in total? So there are eight. So there are eight possibilities. And then how to calculate the probability of drawing the black? We make a ratio 
between how many black there are and how many we have in total. So it's always one class towards everything else, so towards the total, and the other class towards everything there is. So one option is five over eight, five to eight ratio of black, which is 62.5%, and three over eight is probability of picking uh, white, which is 32.2%. And uh, what would be the probability of drawing either black or white? Why? Yes. Why? So it's. Yeah, but the the thing is, you have two classes, but that's the only thing that you can draw. You cannot draw a red one because there is only bl black and white. So the, it's hundred percent probability that you will draw something, and within this hundred percent, it's included the probability of drawing black and white. Yeah. So you understand that probabilities always add up to one. They always have 100%, and then part of that 100% will become distribution. Yeah? So this is the important part. Of course, you're all right. OK. So with Bernoulli's model, problem is that you cannot keep track of the previous outcome. So you can do things, but how to, how to think of how to store what you've drawn before. So how does Markov implement this model, which is also what we will represent it with cups? So, idea is a little bit different. So first what you do is you introduce more cups. So for each possible color of the pebble, you need to have one cup. So if you have two pebbles, black and white, you will have two cups. If you have black ones, black, black, uh, white, and red, you will have three, type, three cups. So here you have two. This is the, the simplest example. And what does this cup then mean in this context? Each cup defines a state for each type of pebble. Yeah. For example, the cup on the left here corresponds to the state which we will call S1. Yeah. We take the cup and we say this cup is called S1. Its, its name is S1. And S1 indicates that we have previously drawn a black pebble. So it, it does not refer to this whatever happens now. It refers to what happened before. So S1 cup will indicate that before what we did was we took the black one. And the cup S2 indicates that what we did before, not now, before, was that we took a white pebble out, out of any container, yeah? So of course you do not know how this works, so maybe like, well, okay, what is this? But yeah, just keep following. So now we know what they indicate. This is indicated on the top, yeah? You see it there, S1, S2, black previously drawn, white previously drawn. But now each cup also has pebbles inside. So each cup contains black and whites, just like we had before with Bernoulli. It has a certain number of blacks and a certain number of whites. Except now there we have two cups, that's the only difference. And the other difference is that we have a state with each cup. So in our example here, the cup on the left has more black pebbles. Yeah. So therefore the probability to draw a black in this left cup will be greater than the probability to draw white ones because simply there are more blacks, yeah? And then now, if you look at the right cup, what would be the probability of drawing a black pebble from the right cup? Hmm? 50. 50, 50, because there is the same number of whites and blacks, so there is equal probability of drawing either black or white. Yeah, so how does this model work? So we have de dependent events. Something happens first, and then something else happens, which is dependent on what happened before. And then the next thing which will happen will be dependent on the previous thing. But something needs to happen first. And in this case, we need to choose the first cup at random. Yeah. So we need to start somewhere. And uh, But this random choice in the beginning doesn't really matter, because if we repeat this experiment, we know that this number will converge. This number will stabilize. Yeah. So what we do, we choose a cup first. And then since cup has a state attached to it, it means that we could also say we choose a state first, yeah? And we choose the first cup or the first state at random. So let's say that we chose the second cup. So we started from the second cup. And this cup indicates the state S2. And S2 means white pebble was previously drawn. And this is not what really happened because we, we didn't have a white pebble drawn before. 
but this, we need to start somewhere. So we make an error at the first step because we never actually drew white yet, but we say, yes, we previously drawn white, which indicates S2. We need to start somewhere because we expect when we repeat this process, this will kind of converge into some stable number. Okay, now, since we selected the cup S2, we need to pick the, the pebble from this container. So I should pick the pebble from the container S2, yeah? Because this is what we chosen. And I pick a pebble from S2. Okay. So now I'm, I'm looking at the container S2 and I'm picking one, up, one pebble from it randomly. Let's say I pick up white. So now we need to write down what we picked. And we do not write down that we have picked the white pebble, yeah? Instead, we try to write the state which corresponds to what we have drawn. And state one says black previously drawn, and state two says white previously drawn. So what state should I write? I just picked up the white, and I need to mark it somehow. And I cannot mark I picked up white or black. I need to mark it with a state. So which state would I, will I describe this with? Two? two? Yes, because two <coughs> says literally white previously drawn. So if I pick up white, I need to describe it with a state. I will describe it with a state as two, white previously drawn. Do you agree with that? Okay, so I write down S2. So I write it at the bottom there, you see? Because there are two things happening. Let's see this, this thing in the middle, this table. This is our thought process, so I'm now thinking. This does not need to be written down, but of course I need to explain you how it works. So this is kind of what I'm thinking about. And then on the bottom is what I'm writing. So what I write, what happened is I picked up a cup at random, took white one, and I say, what happened? What state does this describe? And I see, oh, hey, S2, since I've uh, drawn white, S2 describes this state, I write S2, yeah? Okay, I wrote, wrote S2. Now, we need to repeat the whole process again. So we first need to choose the cup, which is the same as choosing the state. And the state corresponds with what we have drawn before, yeah? But this time, we do not pick the cup at random because we know what happened in the previous step, yeah? We know what we drawn before. So we do not need to, to, to randomly choose the state now. We choose the state from, from what we know happened in the past. And what we have drawn previously? What have we drawn previously? White. white. So we know it. And drawing a white, what state is this? Two. two. Yeah. So yeah, we choose the cup S2. We mark it in the table. So we mark it in our mind. And we choose the, 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 the cup S2 because this is what we previously drawn. First time when we draw it, we draw it at random. We need to start somewhere. But now we know what happened before, so we choose S2. Now we pick the pebble from S2, because we've chosen it, yeah? Pick the pebble from S2, from the right container, yeah? And now let's say we draw on a black this time, yeah? And what state corresponds with what just happened? I drawn a black. One, yeah. State S1 says you just drawn a black. You previously drawn a black. So S1 state describes what just happened. So I say I write state S1. So as you can see, now I picked, first I picked uh, up the right cup, took white, wrote S1, put it back, picked the cup from what, uh, picked the, uh, the cup according to what was previously happening, which is S2, white. Then I pick again from this cup, and this time, this time I take a black one, and black one is described by S1, so S1 previously drawn, so I write S1 now, yeah? Then we again repeat the process, the same process we repeat again. So let's now try to, for you to, to, to tell me what happens. So now we need to choose the state, which, one, which state do we choose? We choose the cup again. One, yeah? because black was previously drawn. We choose state S1. We pick a pebble from left one. This time, let's say we pick up black, black cup. 
What state do we write? One, S1 again. Yeah? Then we repeat. Choose state. Which, which cup should I choose? I choose the cup depending on what I previously drawn. So what did I previously draw? Black one, which is the state? S1. I choose the cup S1. Pick a pebble from S1. I pick up black this time again. I write state one. Choose state S1. Pick a pebble from S1. This time I choose white. What state should I write? Two. Yeah? And this is what I repeat all the time. I just get S1, S1, S2, S1, 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 S1 S2. Yeah? So you get the idea. You have two possible colors, in our case black and white, two possible types of um, pebbles. And this corresponds to two states which mark what happened in the previous step. And the, in the each cup, the ratio between blacks and whites determines the probability of what are we going to pick next. Yeah? For example, in state S1, in a cup S1, we have more black pebbles. And because of that, there is a greater chance to draw a black pebble. And black pebble, drawing a black pebble in before it uh, corresponds to the S1. So if you are in state S1, because there is more black cups, there is a greater probability to again be in S1. And there is a lower probability to go to S2. When you are in S2, though, now you have equal number of blacks and whites, so there is an equal probability of going from S2 to S1 or going back from S2 to S2. Do you understand this part? So according to how these black and whites are distributed in the cups, it depends the probability of going back to itself, going to the other one, or if you are here, going back to itself and going to the other one. Yeah? So this is how we can represent it with the diagram. Yeah? We have four probabilities now. First two are probabilities going from S1 to S2, or going from S2 to S1, so S1, S2, S2 to S1. And another two probabilities going from S1 back to S1, or going from S2 back to S2. And now imagine that we can run this procedure like Bernoulli, and we also cannot see what is inside of the container. Now they're black. So Markov, what he said here, is he made an assumption that if both states are reachable, which means, practically, we need to have at least one black and at least one white inside of each cup. So this is the necessary condition. If we have that condition, then this frequency of S1 to S2, if we repeat this process, will also converge to a fixed value. Yeah? And also the ratio between S1, frequency of S1 and S2, and the ratio between S1 and S2 will converge in time. And this is called a Markov chain. This is important to, to understand. And now, if we remove the physical cups and we only have the states, this is the diagram. Yeah? And this is the simplest Markov model, which has two possible states and four possible transitions between states. Yeah? And these four possible transitions means there are four probabilities there. And these probabilities are dependent on, on the distribution within each state. And if we introduce more states, we will have more transitions and then, of course, more probabilities. If we have three states, we have nine transitions, thus nine probabilities. So we have, which are the probabilities? From S1 to itself, from S1 to S2, from S1 to S3, from S2 to itself, from S2 to S1, from S2 to S3, from S3 to itself, from S3 to S1, and from S3 to S2. Nine, yeah? If we have four states, how many transitions we can have? 16. Yeah, 16. It's always the square. If we have three, then three squared is nine, two squared is four, four squared is 16. Yeah. Now the question is, would you be interested as a practice to maybe make an, make an experiment with three states and, make the mar and then make this Markov chain here and calculate, for example, the probabilities of, of this chain or or not actually yeah let's let's I, I will ask the question after the next one maybe the next one is more interesting yeah 
And if you remember what I was talking before, Turing's paper for 1937, he was, uh, he was made a, a kind of an answer to, to Hilbert about Hilbert's and Scheinberg's problem. And in the same way, Markov's 1906 paper came as an answer to this Nekrasov's claim that independence is only a necessary condition for the law of large numbers. But both of these models introduced a very ingenious mathematical construction, a very simple one. And both of these constructions that you see here, actually one, one you see here, can be implemented mechanically, and it seemed to be kind of un universally applicable. And now to explain you, there's two sides to Markov chain. One is to construct it for, like this, and another is to, to, to calculate probabilities based on the observations about the world that you have. So the other way around, to implement, to get the probabilities uh, from uh, the real world observations. So this is something that I will explain you how it works so that you better understand what is Markov process. And uh, this is what he did actually in his paper in 1912. And, but the essential requirement of this experiment is whatever you need to model, whatever you want to model, you must be able to discretize this thing that you are modeling into a kind of successive uh, sequence of events. So there must be some kind of time or unfolding present and you need to discretize it in time, yeah? And uh, in this discretization, you always have to take two things together. The next one should be kind of dependent on the previous one. So you always cut in a way that you have two things, one is before the other. And uh, let's say in this experiment that I made here on the table, um, I don't know if you're kind of familiar with binary numbers. Do you know what binary is about? Why is that even useful and, and stuff like that? Do you know that any number can be uh, converted into binary? Or that any s sequence of writing can be converted into binary with the right encoding? You heard about ASCII encoding. So you have a name. And then you have something called ASCII encoding, which means that if when you transfer this to binary, which means that, yeah, you take seven, you have a container of seven uh, bits, this is a full bit, and each of them can host either zero or one. Uh, each one of these kind of signatures that you have here correspond to one letter. For example, this would be, I don't know, large C, although it's probably not, of course, I just, yeah. And then a different sequence can be A or can be zero. This is a just kind of encoding. But would you like to know more about the binary numbers? That's also the question. Would you be interested to know what they are about, why they're important, if you do not know? Huh? Yeah. All right. Then I guess we will split this today's class, which is maybe not bad. Um, as you know, you know, if you would like to count something, what would you imagine would be the, the simplest way of counting, for example? Um, if I had... three elements here, how would I count how, uh, pieces of fruit on the table, what would be kind of the easiest way of counting them? If I didn't know how to count, how, do, how would I tell, explain to you how many of them there are? Yeah, just, yeah. Can you point them and say one? Yeah, imagine that I cannot point to them. I need to tell you, but I cannot point. I would look at every element and say, is, is this a fruit or is this a fruit? Imagine, so you have it at home, and you go to someone, and you want to explain to them that you have three, but you do not know numbers. How would you kind of explain to someone? Describe them, if they're individual. How do you ex describe the three? Yeah, fingers, or you can go to the wall and say, make three, and say, yeah, this maps to this one, this maps to this one, this maps to this one, and then this person might understand that this is different from this, yeah, or three fingers, or, yeah. So you make a kind of mapping between, between this element here and this element here, and this is a concrete element, and they are very abstract, this, because the, this can be an airplane, yeah? So you can make a kind of mapping. What is the problem with this 
way of numbering things. Exactly. It gets very long. Imagine that you have 1,000 things. You need to have a mapping of 1 to 1 to 1,000 things. So what's the solution? The easiest kind of idea, what would be then the solution? Make packages. Yeah, make packages. Say, if I have a certain amount, I do not even know what are they, but I can say that this exact amount, I will now call it x, yeah? So now when I write x this, I know that this will map back to be replaced with, with this, yeah? And then if I write two x's, I don't have to write the 20 of these, yeah? Or if I write five, this means that if I write this, uh, this means that I think actually about this. Yeah. So you know this, of course. But then, this is also weird, because how then you decide, you know, you need to kind of decide is this. It's kind of also complicated. You have something which you need to... What happens if you have billion? You know, you then need to inv invent many other new symbols. The larger the number, more symbols you have, you know? It gets kind of cumbersome. So there should be kind of more universal way to, to, to deal with these things. And, it, and it's also dealing with packaging. And this is the idea of positional numbering system. So you say in positional number system, uh, you said you have positions, yeah? And then in these positions, you say you put things which are of one uh, magnitude, yeah? So if you have less than 10, you put them here, you, you mark them here. So you mark three apples here. As long as you have more than 10, this 10, if you have 13, this goes to the tenths place, yeah? So this is, says that I have tenths of things. So if I have 13, I have one tenth and three ones. So literally I have one of these and three of these. If, if I want to have more, I go to hundreds place, and this, this ratio is always times 10, yeah? Because I have 10 symbols from 0 to 9. This means that I will always multiply by 10 to go to the next level, because I have 10 symbols. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Well, it's not 10. So, 213. 200, 110, 8, 3, ones. yeah? And now imagine to say, so this is the, the whole thing there is. Instead of having nine symbols, what happens if we have only two symbols? Exactly the same happens. It's just, this is a little bit different. We still have the same positional system. And this one is for, this one was from zero to nine. And this one is, will be from zero to, to one. So this one fr was from 0 to 9. This one is from 0 to 1. So if I have 0 things, I will write 0 here. If I have 1 thing, I will write 1. So 1 is the same. If I have 2 things, I cannot draw it represented here. I need to go to the next level. The next level goes by multiplying this level by, if this was 9 symbols multiplied by 10, then this symbol will be multiplied by two. two. So this is two's place. This was one, uh, one's place, tenth place, hundredth place. This is one's place, two's place. If I have zero here, this means that I have zero twos. So there is no two. If I write one here, this means that I have one two and one one, which is how much in total? Three. So three is this. Yeah? If I go to the next level, I multiply by right two. This is fourth place now. If I have zero fours, zero here. If I have one four, I have one four. So how much is this? Yeah. So let's count in binary. 
zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Zero is zero, one is four. Two is just think. I have one, two, and zero one. Zero one? And what would be in zero one? Zero one would mean that I have zero twos and one ones, okay. which is one. Yeah? yeah? Zero. One zero. Yeah. You agree? Two is one zero. What is three? One one. Yeah? Now I see that I cannot go further with this. If I go to the next number, I need to go to, to the next one. What would be four? Zero zero uh, one zero zero. Exactly. One zero zero five. One zero one six. One one zero seven. One 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 eight. One zero 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 nine. One zero zero one ten. One zero one zero. Exactly. If I had, so, look at this. This one has length of two, of one. These one have length of two. These ones have length of three. These ones have length of four. Yeah. Imagine now that I would like to make a number, container for numbers, container for binary numbers, which can contain eight places. This is the package. I can fill it with ones or zeros, take all of these places. What ranges of numbers are numbers, de decimal numbers, could I, refer, could I fill in this container if I used binary? What is the smallest number I can put there? It, it cannot be zero. It, it has to fill all of these. It is zero, by the way. <laughs> but how to represent it here? Yeah. Only eight zeros, yeah? True. The smallest number that can fit in this container. What is the largest binary number that can fit into this container? Hmm? Eight ones. Yeah, eight ones. How big is this number? Okay, how did you calculate it? Yeah, that you want to explain how did you get it? <laughs> you can, yeah, you can say this is one's place, yeah? So one yeah, plus, two, two, two. plus two, plus four, plus eight, yeah? Plus 16, plus 32, plus 64, plus 128, yeah? But is there an easier way to calculate? Yes, the, the next position. Yeah, so the next position, if you had one more place, this would be what number? Plus 256. Yeah, minus one. Yeah, yeah. so that's the whole the thing. So this, 255. Uh, 255? Maximum number. What is the range? How many numbers can fit, can we describe in this, uh, with this uh, range? How many numbers are there from 0 to 255? 256. 256 numbers from 0, including 0 to 255. This is called one byte. One byte contains eight positions called bits. These are bits. This is a byte. One bit equals how many bytes? One byte. 
8 bits. 2 bytes. 16 bits. What does it mean to have a 64-bit uh, four, uh, processor? To represent a number with 64 places. To make basic calculations with 64 of these places. You can calculate at home what number that, what number that is. Yeah? So this is how you represent numbers. Now, of course, there's a, there a way how to represent decimal numbers as well. It's very cool, but I don't want to go there. But another thing which is good at bi binary, first of all, this thing can be modeled 1 and 0, you know? 1 to 9, it's kind of difficult if you want to make a machine. What would be nine factors of a machine? Imagine having some nine kind of things to work with to represent a number. It's complicated. But if you have 0 and 1, one can be, you know, on, one can be off. So this can be easily mechanically reproduced. For example, if you have power through the circuit, then this is one. If there's no power in the circuit, that's zero. So then by vibrations of the electricity, you can des describe a number, yeah? Because one will be on and zero will be off. So it's very easy. But also what you can do is say this signature will be a letter A, for example. And this signature will be a letter Z. But, yeah, we can do that, but how it is usually, how it used to be done is with this thing called ASCII, and ASCII is an encoding. ASCII doesn't take, ASCII does not take eight places, but it takes seven places, which is the size of how much, how, much, how many numbers, how many s numbers can fit in a seven uh, place container. If in an eight place container you can have 256, how many numbers can fit in a seven place container? 128, the half. So what they did is they say each of these signatures will correspond to one letter of the alphabet. For example, this will be P. And then they put small Latin letters, large Latin letters, uh, number characters, uh, all these things, they encoded it into binary numbers, and they call this anti-encoding. So when you see a number of zeros and ones, it is meaningless. This can be anything, yeah? But if you say it's ASCII encoding, ah, then you say, okay, I know. I take my sequence, A, B, C, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, doesn't mean anything. But if it's, if, if someone tells you this is encoded in ASCII, then you can say, okay, I just need to split it into parts of seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I need to see in a, in a code book, what letter is this? So this is S and then this is P and then SP and then this is a word, yeah? So in this way, you can encode numbers and operations with numbers, decimal or whatever, and also letters with binary. So you can encode anything in binary. Okay, it didn't take that long, actually. But now you know what, what it's about. Do you need some more explanations about this, or are you happy? All right, now let's get back to this. Now we have this sequence of letters. And now, as you know, this can be a text, depending on the encoding or it can be a number of measurements. So it can be, for example, that you have 8-bit, 1-byte encoding of numbers, and then these are the num actually encoding the numbers from, um, from 0 to 255, yeah? Or whatever it is. But the binary, the nice thing is, you do not have to always uh, care, yeah? You can still work with it. So now let's assume that this sequence of letters is our measurement or our text, yeah? Doesn't matter what it means. But we know that it's read from left to right. So the time goes from left to right. It's right and written from left to right. So the meaning is kind of unfolding from left to right. Or the measurement, so older measurements on the left and newer measurements on the right. So how we can model this? 
So let's see first what would be a kind of classical way to model this sequence. How would, what would statisticians do? So they would be interested to estimate what is the ratio of zeros to, ze to ratio of ones, yeah? Zero, ratio of zeros to ones. So if we assume that ones are independent from zeros, independent events, then we can approach it like Bernoulli. Then the, the first step of estimating probability would be simply to count the number of ones and zeros, and then also count total number of symbols. And now when we know these values, then it's very easy to calculate probability of each class of symbols appearing uh, independently, yeah? How do we do it? We divide the number of e elements of each class with a total number, yeah? This is what we did before. And then we can uh, kind of obtain the probabilities of how often zero occurs or how often one occurs. So for example, here we have 31 characters in total. We have 17 uh, blues, uh, 17 zeros, which are indicated with a blue color, and 14 reds, which are indicated with, um, 14 ones indicated with red. So probability of having zero is 17 over 31, which is, this means that distribution of character is 55% zeros and 45% ones. As, any, as you can see, statistical treatment is not very rich of give, explaining us what's going on here, yeah? You can just know the kind of overall uh, probability, but it doesn't tell you anything about kind of the order, what's going on in the next step. So this statistic has no idea, yeah? And now let's see how we would do this with Markov chains, with this experiment we did before. So first, we need to introduce this notion of a history, what happened before, and how we do this. We can make sure that whenever we cut this sequence, we want to cut it, we always take two elements together. And then we need to determine what kind of possible successions of events are there. So if we discretize, what can we possibly get? What kind of two letter, two, two element pairs can we get if we have zero and one? And it's really easy to understand that you will have only four combinations. You will have zero followed by zero. You will either have zero followed by one. You will either have one followed by zero or you have one followed by one, yeah? So these are four possibilities which we can encounter in this encoding. If we had more symbols, there will be more possibilities. If we have three symbols, then we will be more, yeah? So now what we do is we divide this sequence so that we take two successive elements always. So example, in, as you can see down there, you have first two elements are zero, second and third element, we'll, we will take them as one, and we will count them as one, uh, third and fourth will be two, fourth and fifth will be three. You know, you see what I'm doing there. And then from these 39 symbols in total, now I have 29 pairs, yeah? So we have 29 pairs, and in these 21 pairs, one comes before. So one is, uh, the, the, the right one will be dependent on the left one, yeah? So this is how we make it. Now we just separate these things. So from this thing, I just separate all of these pairs. I copy them, put them like this. So now you see the first two pairs are, are, are zero, zero, then the next one is zero, zero again, the next one is zero, one, and so on. So now I have 29 of them. And then simply what I need to do is I need to count how, m how much do I actually see them in the real sequence, how much I, I can, how much I see these four possibilities how, how are these four possibilities, how are uh, actually these pairs on the left distributed in the possibilities on the right? And then you can, of course, put the numbers there. And what, what you see there is that zero, zero happens six times. I went through and counted. Zero, zero happens two times in the sequence. Zero, one happens 11 times. One, zero happened 10 times. And one, one happens three times. Yeah? So, there is a better way to represent this than a table. So we can show it like a diagram, or if you want it on a compact way, on the right, there's a table. So this should be an easier to read. So now you have zeros and ones on one side. You have how many times zero goes after zero, how many times one goes after, after one, how many times zero goes, uh, one goes after zero, and how many times zero goes after one. You can see them there with numbers or in the table. Also on the table, you see that from zero to zero, there is six times, and from zero to one, there is 11 times, and in total, from zero to any other, there is 17 uh, counts, yeah? 
And now if we want to calculate the actual probability, the only thing we need to do is we need to divide the number of transitions from each particular state to the total number of divisions of that state. For example, we need to, in, to, to get the probability of 0 to 0, we need to divide 6 with total number of 17. Yeah? If you want to calculate the probability of transitioning from 0 to 1, we need to divide 11 that we have found with a 17 of possible in total, as you can see there. If you want to calculate from zero, from 1 to 0, then there are 10. 10 divided by 13 in total. And from 1 to 1, there are 3 uh, counts divided by 13 in total. So then the probability of 0 to 0 is 35%. Probability of 0 to 1 is 65%, which gives 100. And probability from 1 to 0 is 77. Probability from 1 to 1 is 23. Yeah? OK. And then, of course, we can now see what Markov chain, how Markov chain models this random, uh, actually, it's not random, models this process that we have described with binary. Yeah? This is how it models it. So it tells us the possibility of transition. When you find something, when you find yourself in a similar uh, data, it tells you what is the probability if you are in 0 to go to 1 next, and what's the probability of going to 0 next. Yeah? Or if you find yourself on 1, what is the probability of the next step? Yeah? And now, imagine that we want to translate this into cups. We want to make machine. We want to make a machine that reproduces statistically equivalent sequ sequence with pebbles. How do we do this? Is, do you have any idea? How we translate this? So we have a sequence. How we translate it into machine that emulates this with cups? We have how many cups do we have? Two. Uh, let's call this S0 or Z0 and this one. How many types of pebbles we have in each cup? What kind of pebbles we can have, for example? Black and white? Yeah? So we have black and white. Certain number. What would be the number of pebbles that I should put inside to mimic, uh, in order to produce, in order when you start doing the process with the cups, that you get the similar sequences as, as that one? It's very easy. Or 1,000. It can be 1,000 or 1 million, yeah? But what would be the distribution? Exactly. I would need, for example, to put 35 blacks and uh, 65 whites, and I need to put 70. In the other one, I put 77 blacks and uh, 33 whites, or 350, 650. Yeah. So if I do that, if I make up cups like this, and if you think of that as a machine, if you start drawing things and writing down, you should get a sequence which is statistically identical with the, the one up there. So you can make a machine that will emulate a sequence like that. That's for me a very kind of fascinating thing to realize. And then with Markov chain, if you see this automatically generated text or bots, <coughs> they create fake text which looks like the original text by taking Markov chains, by, by taking normal text and calculating the probabilities between characters and groups of characters or words, and then you get fake text generated with this idea. Yeah? And you get the probabilities, and you simply make this into a computer program, and you generate fake text, which looks like original. Well, actually, it's kind of meaningless, but it looks, appears to be, to have the same statistical distribution. Yeah? For me, that's very interesting. So now it's one hour. Um, let me just check quickly. I have four more slides. So I guess we will stop with probability today. But the question is, would you like to just calculate, to make an example that we just had before uh, with three states? For example, if we no, do, not, do not have only ones and zeros, can we make a machine? that makes a sequence with three letters. 
would you be interested to do it here on the to just do it quickly in, in five ten minutes yeah, yeah? all right so let's choose three characters let's yeah let's say we are modeling some game where you have choices when you're playing to go for example up or down or not to do anything so have three states so a game let's say we are modeling a game yeah so we have up we will say that this is a letter uh, U we have down we will say that this is a letter D and when we have nothing which is the letter N so I need you to help me to generate a random sequence of elements let's say that this is a meaningful gameplay so tell me a randomly uh, uh, letters please and I will write it down as you as you are saying as you are yeah Someone else also get in, get in so that we have more random. Come on, come on, we need more. This, we have more states, we need more data. Okay, let's say it's enough. Okay, first step. Let's see statistically how many we have. So U, D, N. How many U's we have? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven U's. D, one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it ends. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah. This is our statistics. How many characters we have in total? I think you listed you. Yeah? Yeah. Eight. Yeah, help me. I mean, help me here. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight, huh? All right, what are the possible combinations of characters that we have? Possible combinations starting with you. So always two. Yes. Uh, starting with you first. U, 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 N, U, D. U, 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 N, U, D. Uh, starting from D. D, 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 N, U, D, D. D, 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 N, D, U. And uh, with N? And N, N, D, and N, U. Okay, how many times we have U, U? Can you help me? I mean, I'm sorry for my handwriting. Once. One, huh? This one. Okay, U, N? One. Two, three, four, five, five. U D. One, twice. Uh, D D. One, two. Two, huh? Would you say two? Mm -hmm. BN? I mean, if you can help me in advance, it will be faster. So you start doing some of this and then tell me. DN? One, two, three. Yeah? Well, I hope we count it well. In a computer, that's easier. Sorry? Four and then one, two, three, one, two, three. Three. And D? Three. 
Can you? Good. Okay. Now we have three states. U, B, N. From U to U, how many times? One. From B to D, how many times? From N to N? From U to D? Two. From D to U? From U to N? Five. From N to U? From B to N? From N to D? Okay. Now let's calculate the probability. That's easy. From N to N is actually three. Ah, N to N. That's right. Okay, to represent probability, we have represented in a table like this. U, D, N. U, D, N. U, U once. U, D twice. U, N five times. Is that right? D, U four times, D, D two times, D, N three times, N, U two times, N, D three times, and N three times. In total, five plus two plus one, eight, nine in total, yeah, and uh, eight. And now, finally, let's make it once again. Yeah, not so nice. Yeah, what to do? U, D, N, <coughs> U, D, N. One divided by eight. Can someone take a calculator or whatever? Can we write V in um, But we want to find the number of tables to make a machine. So if someone has a phone, just divide one by one. Yes. Zero, one, two, five. Two divided by eight. Zero, two, five. Uh, five divided by eight. Uh, four divided by nine. Point four four. Two divided by nine. Point two three. Three divided by nine. Zero three. Yeah. Three. Uh, two divided by nine. Zero point five. Yeah. Three divided by. Uh, sorry, two by eight. Three by eight. Point three seven. And this is. This is 366 six or? 375. 375, seven 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 sorry. And three, okay. 375, yeah? Okay, we made it. So if we now have want to make a machine that reproduces this, here, yeah, we will have three cups. Three cups having three types of things black ones, white ones, and red ones. First cup will have 125 uh, U's, 250 D's, and 6,250 N's. No, uh, 625 N's, sorry. Second cup will have 440 U's, 230 D's, and 330 N's. And third cup will have 250 U's, uh, 375 D's, and 375 N's. And, and if you start picking stuff from it, you will get a sequence which is statistically identical with this. Yeah, so you can reproduce text by making a machine learning. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so what crazy Markov did in his 1913 paper, 
he, the paper name is an example of statistical investigation of the text Eugene Onegin or Evgeny Onegin concerning the connection of samples in chains. So he tried to show what is his model possible to do in a very weird example. So he took this famous poem by Pushkin and he took 20,000 characters from the poem and he wanted to show, to see whether Pushkin's writing will have a different distribution of characters than if we had a random uh, sequence of characters. So whether written text has a different distribution, whether characters are dependent in each other more than in a random distribution. Yeah. So he, he took 20,000 letters of a poem and then this is one eighth of the poem. Then he eliminated all the punctuation, as you can see. He just took everything, jammed it back uh, together in a, one long unbroken sequence. And then he made, to make it easier calculation, he made 200 blocks, 10 by 10 characters, and then calculated the number of vowels in each row and column. I don't want to go into detail, but uh, so he figured out that in these 20,000 letters, there were 20,212 20, uh, consonants, 7,788 vowels, and then he counted vowel-vowel pairs, consonant-vowel pairs, vowel-consonant pairs, and consonant-consonant pairs. So you can see the numbers there in the colors. He counted them, and then he took a random sample, calculated what would be a random sample of characters, and what would be the distribution of, of these in a random uh, letters. And then he tried to prove that actually in human writing, in this po Pushkin's poem, we do not have pure randomness. So the, the distribution of characters is not pure random but it is determined in a way, yeah? So this was his idea, to define what dependent variables, variables really mean. And this Markov chain is one of the very, um, this, you can see it, how it works as a machine, is one of the first self-referent mathematical models because there's a probability of an element towards itself. And for almost 40 years after he published his model, there was a famous engineer called Claude Shannon, which is also father of information theory, uh, he described it as an exciting model, but not very practical or feasible because it required enormous amount of observation and computational power to be pragmatic. As you can see, it took us quite some time to, car to, to, to do it for this sequence here. But 60 years later, in 2000s, these aspects are no longer a problem. And in 1996, you have Larry Page and Serge Brin devised a, devised a page rank algorithm at Google for ranking web pages, which is completely based on a Markov chain. So, and this algorithm became a kind of bedrock of Google search engine, which revolutionized internet at the beginning of our century. And how it is implemented, this is also very interesting. Um, it is implemented that each web page that Google crawls is one mark of state, yeah? So it is, instead of white pebble and black pebble that we have here, each web page is one state. So since Google at this time, um, indexes around 50 billion pages. This which means that, that Google's in that page rank, which needs to be computed, has 50 million states, 50 billion states, and 50 billion squared probabilities, so transitions. And, pro and not all transitions are there. The transitions are there. How do you think they define what is a successful transition? How do they count transitions? What are the transitions in the web? In the web? from state to state. So what is the transition from web page to web page? Hyperlinks, exactly. And then they counted the hyperlinks and see what hyperlinks are there in this possibility. And by that, they make a huge Markov model which can predict the possibility of landing on your web page. If you have a high probability of landing at your web page, this means that your uh, page should be at the top of the search. That's why when you search some terms, Wikipedia comes first because Wikipedia has the most number of links coming to it. Yeah. So it's a kind of objective valuation of uh, ranking, not uh, based on meaning, but mean based on what points to it. Yeah. So as you can see, Markov's idea from 1906, unchanged idea of Markov from 1906, combined with the enormous power of computing, this allows Google to answer more than one billion questions per day, from people around the globe, 81, uh, 181 languages in less than one second, uh, one second per question. Yeah, it's quite, quite remarkable actually what is it, how this works uh, bundled with computers. 
And so to give a small recap, I gave you three important references. So Bernoulli, 18th century, expected value. This is one cup that we talked about. Then you have Laplace in 19th century, how things go, um, how things vary from expected value with this famous bell curve. And then in 20th century, you have Markov, and then his idea encapsulate the notion of dependent variables or how things converge when they are dependent on each other. And the uh, next class will be about more about uh, quantum physics and relativity theory, but mostly quantum physics. But I think I think it's enough for today with this. Yeah? I don't want to mix, mix up everything too much. You think this was enough for today? I mean, it's OK. Yeah? OK, so if you have questions, then it will be good to hear them. Or if you need, if you want me to go over something else, something again, feel free. But I think, did you get the idea? Why can't this be very useful? Yeah, also you learned it how to do it yourself for a very small case. Imagine that this with computers is very easy to program. And of course, there are shortcuts how to com compute the page rank. Of course, it's not calculated like this. It would take like forever. Yeah? Would it be a possibility to not only uh, look at the sequence of two, but the sequence of three or four? Absolutely. Even more exact? Yeah. So then let's, let's do it. I mean, I don't want to implement the whole thing. But then what you need to do is what possibilities are there with a combination of three symbols? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So what would you have? You have U, 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 U. And mm -hmm. so you, you will have simply more, uh, more pos you need to take not history of two only, but history of three and see all possible uh, sequences of three, what can, what can happen, mm -hmm. and then count them. And if, if you did it like this, then, I mean, you could get very close to a real language, I, I think. Yeah, but also you can do it not only on letters, you can do it on words. Mm -hmm. Yeah? and then one word or two words together. This is called Google Ngram, if you heard of Ngram. This is exactly that. Markov chains com composing on words, on, and, and not only two words after each other, but up to four or five words together. And they have a, you can download it, it's for free, to down download database for Google Ngrams. It's who knows how many gigabytes. So they simply what they did is they took all the text that they could find, Google Books and everything, and just found all the possible combinations of words that are, that are in the sequence. And then they match them. For example, if you know the same translation, so this is now what is, uh, uh, what is this next level. You have done this in English and then done it in German. And then you know which sentences in English match the sentence in German. So you know that these two sentences are the same thing. It's just one is in English, one is in German. Then you can calculate the probability uh, of what would, then you, when, you, when you know that, then when you know these probabilities, you can then predict what would be the correct translation for an unknown phrase? And this is what happens in Google Translate. Actually, today this works with deep learning because it's more efficient and uh, better results. But you, the, when, how uh, Google Translate started is with the, this kind of models. So you just have a lot of examples. You know the probabilities of, of the real text you, you encountered in books and on web, the web. And you simply count it, put it in a huge database, calculate the probability, and then match two things, match German and English, learn the probabilities of the, for example, matching with uh, daddy does, then you, there's a probability. And then when you encounter the whole sentence new, it gives you probability what should be the translation in German of an English text. This is how it started. This is how Google completely redefined everything based on this 1906 model. So probability is very important. It really marks what we do not know. It doesn't mark knowledge, like it, it's really different from logical thinking. It's really not yes or no thinking. It's really in between, and it still can be very powerful, especially when we have uh, computers and a lot of data. And I will show you then that the machine learning is kind of a next level of that. But uh, this is a very interesting thinking that I think we do not unfortunately have it in architecture. But for me, it would be an interesting question, you know, could we use this in a way? I do not know how yet, of course. I try to give in my example how would I use it, but uh, yeah. But I think it's a, it's a different perspective. And I think because of that, information technology today is really super uh, powerful, even all too powerful. Google is like literally, a, it's a new kingdom, you know, you know it's, it's not kingdom, it's like, 
Yeah, I don't even know how to say it. They're kind of conquering the new world and charging you your kind of um, taking the public space of internet and monetizing it because there's no one to stop them, you know. But of course, what we need is politics on this level. And over time, I think things will start to stabilize. You will, it's not anymore like going to be Wild West, what we have in the web. It will be a police there and an army or, you know, there will be some kind of politics that will happen in this public space. So some rules would need to happen. But for a long time, Google didn't have any competitor just because of smart thinking. Unfortunately, this is enough to have such a smart um, people like Marco and someone to recognize this. And you conquer the whole world. You make the biggest company in the world just by ideas, which is a very different thing, which is something which happens today and which was never possible in this scale before. Of course, Google now, people hate it. It's too powerful. Yeah, but this is now a different topic, you know, how to make a politics on this because it's too powerful to just let it run on itself. And I think EU is trying to, for example, today to do something about it and all of that. But of course, not only Google, also um, Facebook and all of these guys have models which are based on this kind of thinking, um, which, um, which are probability-based models, never, yeah, never exact models. It's a very kind of different kind of thinking. Yeah, so this is kind of, in this idea, we will re uh, continue our discourse. We saw what Logisys did. We saw what architecture this produces on computers. But now we will want to go explore this route more from the next class. So yeah, if you have no longer questions, then it's finished for today. Thank you.